Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Vollmer. I'm a computational linguist at the Limba Corporation here in Richardson, Texas. And I know we've had a lot of exciting presentations today, and I'm here at the end of, uh, the end of them all. But before you leave, we're going to go over the exciting topic of federal regulatory compliance. So <laughs> stay in your seats, OK? <clears throat> Okay, so just a bit of background, what Limba does. We're an NLP corporation, natural language processing. We, <clears throat> which I have another slide, a quick explainer on NLP. But primarily we look to, uh, <clears throat> we have customers we can input or take in large amounts of text data, like uh, if you work for Goldman Sachs, You've produced thousands of uh, financial forecasts. We can take in, process large amounts of text data, extract the valuable information from it. Our uh, primary software package is called K-Extractor, Knowledge Extractor, to create actionable knowledge. So what that means is we apply NLP techniques from the uh, large collections of data, extract the information, and the knowledge creation is the key here because the NLP pipeline, when we go from tokenization to part of speech tagging, then syntactic, semantic parsing, what we can eventually do is create an RDF store of uh, Sparkle queryable triples that we've essentially created an ontology automatically from the customer's raw input data. And we're not even talking about like a database, we're talking like PDFs, you know? Okay, so what is natural language processing? So, everyone, form a uh, mental picture of this. I bet it wasn't that. Okay, so natural language processing, in general, means, because uh, I know not everyone here is an NLP person, uh, natural language processing, in general, deals with the field of computers taking in, processing, and analyzing human natural language. Uh, if anyone's ever used Google Translate, that is a particular subfield, machine translation of natural language processing. There was some talk earlier about natural language understanding. Parsing this and having the computer understand that it doesn't mean this would be part of natural language understanding. So we would have to uh, perform uh, word sense dis disambiguation. It's going to be a task here. So duck can mean several things. We would want to disambiguate it to understand that it's actually a verb rather than a noun, uh, you know, something like that. So quick one minute overview of NLP. Now, in our particular use case, so this will be about text classification for automotive regulatory reporting, a little proof of concept work we did for a uh, client. I hope you've heard of them. Uh, now, what it was. Our product, K-Extractor, can be customized to particular domains depending on the customer's needs. In this particular case, the automotive domain. So we can extract for them you know, various features about the car input, uh, makes, models, uh, VIN numbers, fairly standard stuff. But the particular use case is NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, requires quarterly early warning reports from every uh, manufacturer in North America that does business. So if you're Honda or GM and you get uh, complaints from your customers about, you know, my tire burst at, on the freeway, that has to be logged, recorded, and then every quarter you send a report to NHTSA about what happened. And there's uh, quite an incentive uh, to comply because, for instance, Fiat Chrysler was fined $175 million in 2015 for relatively minor uh, infractions, uh, compliance issues. So, <clears throat> like I said, uh, what we do here, we have input from uh, we have complaints. They can come from lots of different sources. For instance, uh, phone calls, so a call center. Uh, people call in, say something's wrong. Uh, emails, uh, snail mail, you know, just letters sent by USPS to Honda, you know, about what went wrong. But 
in one particular case, we have uh, online chat, chatbot complaints. So Honda provides on its website a service called Ask Dave, a little chatbot where customers can come on and say, you know, hey, I was driving the other day and my airbag deployed uh, without cause, stuff like this. And the, the chatbot takes in all the information, it's logged, and then comes the exciting part because usually you have a team of subject matter experts, human annotators, who have to go through all of that chat and assign it to one of 26 predefined categories that come from NHTSA. So NHTSA says, you know, these, there are 26 potential subsystems of a car that we're interested in. Every complaint you receive, you have to give us the make, model, year, or the VIN number, and then you also have to assign a complaint to one of these 26 categories. Now, they're predefined, so it's closed set, and also the parts or you know, various components that might belong to that subsystem, they're, they're publicly available information. It's listed by NHTSA what they expect. But a keyword-driven approach isn't, there's gonna be problems if you want to automate this process because manual annotation consumes time uh, and it's labor intensive, it's expensive. And if you have to do this every three months, you can't just collect, you know, and you're collecting like thousands of complaints. You can't just wait three months and then try to turn that all out in a week. It's a constant iterative process. So if you can find a way to automate it, you know, there's a, a great rewards to that. But a keyword approach is going to have some issues. So here we have some complaints. So I turn the key and hear a sound from the engine, but it doesn't start. And we also have my car does not start. Now, they seem pretty similar, but the first one, according to the annotators we talked to, well, that's an engine issue. And the second one, that's likely to be an electrical issue. Now, according to them, the difference here is mentioning, okay, I hear a sound. Well, according to them, that means, okay, person stepped in the car, turned the ignition, you know, the battery's good, but the starter motor's good, but something's causing the engine not to turn over, right? This one, the implicature is that they get into the car, maybe they turn the ignition, and they don't hear anything at all, and maybe the battery's dead. Absent any other information, that's the difference, and it leads to two separate classifications. Now, we might say, okay, uh, hear a sound then is the key phrase here, and we could look for that. But again, this is a relatively simple example here, and you can already see, we're, if we try to use in keywords, we're already running into some issues. So, our approach. So, we implemented a deep learning framework and we've extracted as well some uh, semantic features relevant to the domain. This is all part of our customized K-Extractor we delivered. And we ended up with uh, accuracy level of over 90% on a test set from the customer. Now, besides being a nice uh, high even number there to report on, it actually has a pretty significant meaning for this particular domain and task because according to our customer, if you have um, greater than 10% error rate in your quarterly reports, uh, whether you have humans producing them or it's done automatically, but a error rate of 10% or more vastly increases the odds of being audited and then being fined, you know? So uh, there's a high motivation to get over 90%. And this was an, an improvement over a baseline system we were working off of that was primarily rules-based and lexicon-driven that was uh, achieving a 68% uh, accuracy rate on the same test set. So <clears throat> we have here uh, some nice uh, screenshots from a uh, little nice demo UI that we have for our project. Now, uh, for instance, we have some input, a chat complaint. Mike is my 2015 CRV in the Takata inflator recall, followed by his VIN number. Now, we extract, and again, it's a fairly trivial process, we extract uh, other information, VIN number, make, model, year, complaint, is there one, is it reportable? 
Uh, reportable is a formulaic thing. It just means is there a make, model, year, or VIN number, and is the car uh, less than nine years old? You know, because NHTSA is not or too concerned if your 1995 Civic is uh, you know finally you know kicked the bucket. Uh, so. But the big one here, the uh, correct category code that we're trying to identify. So we have airbags. And show of hands, has anyone ever heard of Takata? I thought so. Me, you yeah. <laughs> know. I'm not alone then. Yeah, so uh, it would seem that the model has learned to associate. Here we have Takata inflator, but no mention of airbags. As those who raise their hand, they're in the know. Uh, Takata inflators are found in something like 70 million vehicles in North America. They're currently under recall. You know, they have a tendency to explode and then like, you know, metal shards will, you know, puncture people's chests, things like this. So, <clears throat> uh, you can see why potentially a uh, automotive manufacturer would have a great interest in correctly identifying that Takata inflator is a uh, potentially recallable problem associated with airbags. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so besides the coding issue itself, uh, like I said, we're working in the chat domain. So that poses some unique problems as far as, let's call it a genre of, com of uh, style. So compared to, so let's say we're taking in uh, emails, for instance, right? They uh, tend to be longer, a bit more formal in structure. Or if we have uh, transcribed uh, phone conversations, again, you have the first person in the call center, usually a bit knowledgeable because they're working for the company. They can you know, relay the customer what they wrote down and paraphrase. But chat tends to be very punctuated or have bad punctuation, grammar, capitalization problems. It's very terse, so it's very short, average complaints that we had to work with was like seven tokens. Uh, so you have less data to train on as well uh, when you're doing your classification problem. So for instance, we have like this one. We have a Tochukwu 2008 Honda Pilot. Please explain this code for me, P0743. Please, what is this fault code, P0743? So you can see we've got make, model, year, 2008. So it's not reportable. But we still classify it, and we have powertrain. Now, you know, you might say, okay, previous slide, well, once we have a little world of domain information, Takata inflator, it makes sense that that should be classified as airbags. But what about this? We don't have any mention of uh, powertrain components here. <clears throat> well, it would seem, at least if you were having a human do this task, so P0743, these are the uh, fault codes that uh, the onboard diagnostic computers produce for uh, mechanics. Uh, P0743 is a uh, clutch circuit issue. Uh, so that definitely, you know, clutch connects the uh, engine to the transmission. So that would be appropriately classified as a powertrain problem. So it looks like our model is actually capturing some of this information. Now, you and you can also see you know, the uh, misspellings, you know, uh, other problems with the grammar. So, you know, within the domain, we're having no problem properly processing the chat input, learning from it, and then we're actually handling these pretty difficult edge cases. Now, the cynic might say, okay, well, maybe the model's just learning any capital P followed by a sequence of digits, that goes to powertrain. I've checked, actually, you know, we also had a, one where it was like, someone just says P0301. That's a misfiring cylinder. It actually went to engine instead. So we actually are being able to distinguish, the model is distinguishing between air codes, it would seem, based upon the data, the test data. Okay, one last one. So implicit categorization. So we have Larry Christensen, we have a 2014 Honda CRV that operate that vibrates at highway speeds. Is there a service bulletin for this problem? Small misspelling there at the end too, because it's a chat complaint. So we've extracted our information. Yeah, this is a pretty recent vehicle, so we're gonna report it. And we've categorized it as wheels. Now, okay, so the 
previous slide, it was like, okay, you know, that requires some expert knowledge, but I can look up fault codes in a book, you know, um, and eventually maybe learn what that was. And Takata Inflator, if I read the news, I might know that's an airbag issue. Here, well, what do we have to work with if we were a human even? So we have uh, vibrates at highway speeds. That seems to be the source of the complaint. Well, again, talking to the people that do this for a living, the annotators, if a human were to code this, the correct answer is wheels. So absent any other information, just based on this, the most common source of unknown vibration at highway speeds is going to be some sort of defect in the wheel, improperly mounted, you know, not correctly aligned, something like that. So would seem that we're actually correctly capturing some of this information about the automotive domain, including this sort of implicit knowledge that, uh, yeah, it really does take, um, you know, even a human annotator quite a bit of experience with the problem and the task in order to achieve. Okay, so a couple uh, frequently asked questions. So size of the training data, well, Again, bit tautological here, right? But more is always going to be better. And also system performance relative to the training data size is gonna be task dependent. So if you have a difficult problem, you might need more data. If it's a simpler problem, you might need less. We actually got by at the end with 5,000 annotated customer complaints, chat complaints, that was for training, validation, and tests. We did a 70-20-10 split on the data we had available. But it's also possible to leverage other resources to overcome data sparsity issues using transfer learning. So we actually didn't start out with 5,000 annotated complaints. We only had 1,800 from the customer. That wasn't enough. Uh, the model accuracy was worse than the baseline. But what we did have is NHTSA itself is also taking in complaints every, every day, every month, every year and they have to categorize them too with the same codes as well. And that information's pub publicly available and there's a lot more of it. So what we did was we built our model, our framework, and we first trained the model on 500,000 NHTSA sourced complaints from the public data set. You know, for, I can't remember the number of epochs, 40 epochs, uh, froze the model weights, then saved the model, then uploaded it and we unfroze the classification layer, the softmax output layer, and then fed in the 1800 complaints that we had and updated the model weights with, you know, we first trained on a very similar problem, actually the same, just the input text was slightly different, right, because it's not chat. And then we fed in, yeah, our chat da data, the smaller amount, and updated the weights and tweaked them just enough to be appropriate to the problem and task. And we were actually up to 85% accuracy using that method. And what we did was we actually used then that trained model to, uh, I think there was some talk about, you know, augmentation of uh, human uh, work, right? We basically used that to bootstrap ourselves. We had a bunch of unannotated chat complaint. And so we used that trained model that was at 85% to uh, help us annotate uh, an additional uh, 3,200 uh, chat complaints, and then we had to human validate them, but it massively decreased the workload because you know most of them actually were accurate. Okay, type of deep learning. So yeah, we and I heard the name or the <coughs> heard the phrase mentioned before earlier today. So yeah, we had a convolutional neural network with a softmax output layer for multi-class classification. So multi-class. Um, for I'm sure every, most are aware, but for, for those who are here to learn. So that means as opposed to we take in an image and say, is this a dog, yes or no? Instead, we take in a chat complaint and we say, well, which of 26 categories does this belong to? We have to assign it one of many classes. And yeah, it was a convolutional neural network, which I, you know, one of the early presentations at the beginning of the day is extremely well and is quite well renowned for image classification tasks. But I would recommend taking a look if you want to get in depth at Yoon Kim's breakthrough paper, Convolutional Neural Networks for Sentence Classification. 
after the success of CNNs in the image classification domain, people turn their attention to NLP. And it turns out for many NLP tasks, you can get by with using a convolutional neural network instead of an RNN, some flavor of RNN, whether it's an LSTM or bidirectional LSTM, ET, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, again, depends on the task, but if you can get away with it, it's nice because it's actually, it was fa a lot faster to train. <laughs> um, now, uh, we also trained custom word embeddings for the automotive domain with an unsupervised model. So what does that mean? Well, we use a word to vec model, uh, skip gram uh, word vectors. Uh, and we originally had tried out with um, you know, Google's pre-trained word to vec uh, embeddings based off of the Wikipedia crawl, like you know, a couple billion words. And that did all right. But if you have the data available for your domain, you should try training your own word embeddings. So we did. We had the NHTSA data. And what happens is, for instance, uh, for those not familiar with word embeddings, it allows you to tell that there's a similarity between two words. So for instance, as we're before, right, um, you know, uh, if you take a look at your standard Wikipedia embeddings, if you have words like Odyssey and Quest, uh, those, me those will be related in general English. But if you have uh, ones for the automotive domain, you'll have Odyssey, Quest, and then minivan's going to show up there. That that's a, that's a related word. It's not going to be captured in just a general word embedding model. Uh, when we switched to a uh, custom word embeddings for our domain, we saw that was actually the biggest source of improvement. There was a 15% improvement uh, in test set accuracy uh, versus when we just used general word embeddings. And then, so the proof of concept we delivered for the customer, uh, we ended up, as I said, just uh, using the 5,000 annotated chat complaints, but we left the framework in place for transfer learning if there were ever data sparsity issues in the future or for future customers. Okay, and then with that, I've got, I guess, maybe a few minutes if there were any questions. Uh, part of my ignorance, maybe I didn't get the, were you predicting that a topic wheels from other data or uh, you were using just NLP from a bunch of text to predict wheels? Yeah, we're just taking in the chat input and given this sequence of tokens predict, yeah, the uh, NHTSA code, the correct category that problem belongs to. Uh, there is a, uh, non-assignable category, so this isn't a problem um, and as well, so that's one thing that's considered, but we aren't performing any uh, semantic parsing or anything like that in order to assign the code. It's actually it's just token driven. The tokens are then represented as their word to vec their word vectors, and that's what the model is learning to classify. Is there a limit to, uh, is there a pros and cons? What if the Given categories were like 50 or 100, uh, is that uh, what, what happens or? Uh, I mean, we kind of ran out of uh, runway there when we got to 26 categories, but from in general, what we observed was starting off at like maybe 10 different categories and trying that set. Uh, there didn't seem to be a decrease in uh, model performance as the number of labels increased. Uh, but yeah, if you got to you know, a thousand labels or something, yeah, maybe you might see some uh, yeah, problems with your model there. Yeah. Yeah, quick question on, I was a little bit, I guess, confused. Uh, when you were training it, you originally had a 5,000 sample set and mixed results, but then you went to the NHTSA database, you had 500,000. Yeah, okay, so uh, there's a bit of a uh, 
those two are, we've got the order mixed up, and that's my uh, miscommunication there. So we started off, right, from the customer with only 1,800 annotated chat complaints. That was our customer data set. They also gave us a bunch of an unannotated data, because it was like, hey, once you've built the model, give us the, generate the information we need to do our reports to annotate the rest of the data for us automatically. When we tried training a model, uh, a machine learning model using only 1800, the performance is terrible, like 60% or less. So what we started to look at was other options to overcome this data sparsity problem. That's when we took 500,000 publicly available complaints from NHTSA, trained the model first on the 500,000, then trained it to just be a classifier layer on the 1800 to update the weights that were learned on the 500,000. And that we were getting over 85% accuracy with that. What we then did, because we were always going to try to annotate the customer data anyway for them automatically, we ran the unannotated chat complaints through to you know, produce tags, the correct codes. And then we used that to bootstrap. We you know, then had a human review of like 3,200 of those unannotated complaints that we tagged automatically and used that to produce a data set of 5,000. So we went from 1,800, after we bootstrapped ourselves up, we got to 5,000 chat complaints and had annotations that were human to review. Yeah. Uh, maybe one more. Your domain evolves with time, as in six months later, there could be some other issue and you are already locked into what is in NHTSA, whatever is provided to you, right? How do you deal with that? Okay, yeah, so, good question. Uh, so is the issue that, uh, like, a new category might be added? Oh, it's a new category. Yeah. Language involves issues involved, and the needs of the product involved. Yeah. Not having online learning, that's true. Uh, so, yeah, um, I mean, to be emphasized, this is just a proof of concept. So, this is more for, this was internal research for both companies. Uh, as far as the training required, actually, so, you know, it's quite easy. These complaints are always going to be collected and be fed in for categorization. Uh, if, uh, especially, so, one of the things that might change, right, uh, is the uh, relative frequency of a different category it might change with time. So right now, a lot of the data contains problems about airbags because everyone has a Takata inflator in their car. Uh, and so that's going to be a high percentage of yeah, customer complaints. It is true, once you know, a year passes, that might be a less common problem. So that means, yeah, there is going to be a need for uh, new training data and, yeah, any uh, production uh, level uh, piece of software is gonna have to account for a way to update the training data and consider, yeah, changes in the outside world, right? Um, well model. This issue is described in enterprises that Human cognition can take a sentence of instruction and immediately adapt to yeah. the new situation. Yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah, uh, any actual uh, production solution would have to require a way to consider updating the model based on changes in the real outside world as different issues occur in cars in the United States. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.